This talk is the second part of a proof of the Riemann-Roch theorem. So the Riemann-Roch theorem, as you recall, states that L of D is the degree of D plus one minus G plus L of K minus D. Where as usual, D is a divisor, that's its degree. This is the genus and K is the canonical divisor. And in the first half, we prove Riemann's half of the Riemann-Roch theorem, which says L of D is equal to the degree of D plus one minus G plus I of D, where this mysterious factor is the index of speciality of the divisor D, which is something like the dimension of the space of obstructions to the mittag leffler problem. And what we're going to prove today is Roch's half of the Riemann-Roch theorem, which says ID is equal to L of K minus D. Um, this part of the Riemann-Roch theorem nowadays is usually proved as a special case of Serre duality. Um, that's what Hartshorn does. But um, Serre duality is a fairly major theorem about high dimensional varieties. And you don't really need it for proving um, this part. Uh, well, obviously, Rock proved it without using Serre duality. Um, in order to simplify the proof, we're going to work over the complex numbers, at least to start with. And when we've done the proof over the complex numbers, I will say a little bit about how you extend it to general fields. The big advantage of working over the complex numbers is we can use the residue calculus where we can sort of integrate over, over paths in the, on, a, on a Riemann surface and apply Cauchy's residue theorem and things like that. So the residue calculus gives us two um, key facts. First of all, if we have a one form, which looks locally like um, um, f of z dz, then it has a residue at any point P. This is a, a meromorphic one form. And the residue is given by one over two pi I times the integral around a contour of um, omega, where here we've got a point P and the contour gamma just goes once around P in a clockwise direction, whatever clockwise means. Um, the second key point is that the sum over all points of a compact Riemann surface of the residue of omega at P is equal to zero. And this is more or less Cauchy's theorem. Um, this only applies to compact Riemann surfaces. Rather, ob rather obvious counterexamples of the surface isn't compact. Um, and the reason is that Cauchy's theorem says the integral around some path is more or less equal to a sum of the residues inside the path up to factors of 2 pi i. And if you've got a compact Riemann surface, then the region, you can also apply Cauchy's theorem to the region outside a path just by considering it as the inside if you look at it from the other direction. So you find that if you've got any path on a Riemann surface, the sum of the residues inside the path is equal to the integral along the path, whereas the sum of the residues outside the path is equal to minus the integral along the path. And from this, it's easy to see that the sum of all residues over all points of a compact Riemann surface is always zero. So these are the two facts um, that we use um, that we get from working over the complex numbers. Um, now we recall that the index of specialization that we want to deal with um, could be more or less defined as R over R of D um, plus K of C, where you remember this was the space of rational or meromorphic functions on the Riemann surface, and this was the ring of valuation vectors. And this was the set of obstructions to the mittag leffler problem. So you remember the mittag leffler problem says that we specify a singularity at each point 
of the Riemann surface, and we want to find a rational function with those singularities. Well, the uh, reason why we're interested in one forms is that a one form omega is an obstruction to the Mittag Leffler problem. And this is because if we've got any one form omega and we've got a function f, we know that the sum over p of the residues at p of omega f is equal to zero. And now we notice that this residue depends on the singular part of f at the point p. So, um, so this gives some condition that the singularities of f at all points have to satisfy in order for them to come from a meromorphic function f. Um, more precisely, we get a bilinear pairing from um, the holomorphic one forms times um, this um, um, space of valuation vectors. Well, I guess we could quotient that by R of zero plus K of C to the complex numbers. So this is just taking a one form omega and um, some set of singularities, which I'll rather sloppily write as F. And you, you just take this to the sum over P of the residue of F omega. So, um, um, so we can, so, so this is uh, what we get if the divisor is uh, just the zero divisor. More generally, we can do something similar for any divisor. So we get a pairing from one forms omega with omega greater than or equal to the divisor. That means, um, remember, this is the divisor of zeros of omega, and we want it to be at least equal to this divisor. And this time, instead of r0, we take r of d plus k of c. And this maps to the complex numbers. And we do exactly the same thing. We just take the divisor and multiply it by the singularities and take some of the residues. And you can check that um, this condition sort of matches up with this condition and make sure that everything is well defined, unless I forgot to put a minus sign in somewhere, which I quite often do. Um, and um, in particular, we get a map from one forms omega with omega greater than root for d to the dual of r over r of d plus k c. Um, and the key point is this map is injective. And it's very easy to see it's injective because um, we can choose a valuation vector with any given singularity at any given point. And from this, it's very easy to get any map from one forms to C by choosing a suitable valuation vector. So showing this as injective is easy. It's also surjective, but this is considerably harder. Um, so we've, we, 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 we know it's injective, and we have to think more about whether or not it's surjective. Anyway, from the fact it's injective, well, we know the dimension of this is L of K minus D. And the dimension of this is just I of D. So from the fact that this map is injective, we find the inequality L of K minus D is less than or equal to I of D. So this is half of Roch's theorem. What we want to show is that L of K minus D is actually equal to I of D. In other words, we want to somehow prove the hard part of the surjectivity. Um, well, proving surjectivity directly is, well, you, you can do it, but it's a little bit tiresome. Um, fortunately, it's not really necessary because it turns out we can actually deduce surjectivity from all the other things we know about the riemann rock theorem. So let's summarize what we know. We know First of all, we know L of D is equal to the degree of D 
plus one minus g plus i of d. So this is Riemann's part. Secondly, we know L of k minus d is less than or equal to i of d. And by changing d to k minus d, we also see that L of d is less than or equal to i of k minus d. So this is this is the, this is the sort of easy part of Rock's theorem. And a third thing we need to know is that the degree of k is equal to 2g minus 2. And we, we worked this out by explicitly calculating the degree of k and found it was, it was equal to this by writing down a, 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 an explicit one form on a, on a plane curve with nodes and so on. Anyway, from these three facts, we're going to deduce that L of k minus d is actually equal to i of d. And to do this, we're going to use this twice, and we're going to use this twice once in this form, and we're going to use this once. So what we do is we just write L of d equals degree of d plus 1 minus g plus i of d. Well, that's just Riemann's part. And this is greater than or equal to degree of d plus 1 minus g plus L of k minus d. Here we've used this inequality. And now we apply Riemann's part again. So this is degree of d plus 1 minus g plus um, L of k minus d is now equal to degree of k minus d plus 1 minus g plus i of k minus k minus d, um, which is, sorry, sorry, uh, just i of, let's get him muddled up, just, just i of k minus d there. And now we apply um, this bit again, which is, a variation of this for a different divisor. So we get degree of d plus 1 minus g plus degree of k minus d plus 1 minus g plus, um, so i of k minus d is at least l of d. And now we seem to have l of d is at least equal to l of d plus this rather messy looking expression here. Well, if you look, degree of d cancels out with degree of minus d. So what's this going to be? Well, if we put everything together, we see that this is degree of k plus 2 minus 2g, two which, uh, well, we worked out degree of k. It's equal to 2g minus 2. So this is just equal to 0. So this whole mess here just disappears. So let's see what, what we've managed to prove. We've managed to prove that L of d is at least equal to L of d. Oh, well, um, that seems kind of trivial. So we don't seem to have proved anything. But if you look more carefully, what you find is we've shown that L of D is greater than or equal to this, which is greater than or equal to L of D. So in other words, this must actually be an equality, and this must actually be an equality. And the only way this can be an equality is if these two things here are equal. So... Um, so we've now actually managed to show that i of d is equal to l of k minus d. And this prove, proves Rock's part of the Riemann-Rock theorem and thus completes the proof of the Riemann-Rock theorem. Um, well, that shows how to prove it over the complex numbers. And now I want to say a little bit about how you prove it over more general fields. So what about, about fields of characteristic greater than zero in particular, when there doesn't seem to be any obvious way of doing contour integration? Well, um, there are two problems. Problem one, need to show that the residue of a one form omega at a point is defined. And the second problem is we need to show the sum over all points of the residue at P is zero. Um, well, the first problem looks kind of trivial. So how do we define a residue? Well, let's choose some local coordinate. 
z at the point p and a residue omega looks locally like um, something of the form a minus n z to the minus n plus plus a minus one z to the minus one plus a naught plus a one z and so on. We can expand it as a formal power series. And why don't we just define the residue to be a minus one? What's wrong with that? We seem to have a perfectly good definition of the residue. Well, there's a big problem here. The problem is, how do we know this does not depend on the choice of z? And you have to be really careful here because it turns out that all the coefficients a i other than a minus one do depend on the choice of z. And if you choose a different local coordinate, they all change. So it's only this particular coordinate which um, doesn't change. Um, I guess I should have put a dz there because um, otherwise that really messes things up. Um, so how do we check this? Well, let's take a look at what happens if we change coordinates. So suppose we change to a different local coordinate, let's call it W. So we might have Z is going to be now equal to B naught W plus B one W squared plus B two W cubed and so on. Um, again, just expanding as a formal power series, where of course B naught is not equal to zero. Um, and let's just try and work out an example. So suppose we've got um, a one form which we can write locally as a minus one z to the minus one plus a naught z naught and so on dz and now let's write this in terms of w well that's quite easy we get a minus one and then we we want z to the minus one which is going to be b naught to the minus one w to the minus one plus various terms plus a naught times something we don't really care about the others and then we have to put down dz which is going to be b naught dw plus various higher order terms. So this is equal to a minus one dw plus um, higher, so a, a minus one w to the minus one dw plus higher terms. Um, and now you see the coefficient of w to the minus one dw is the same as the coefficient of z to the minus one dz. So, so for poles of order one, no problem. It's just very easy to check that the residue doesn't depend on the choice of local coordinate. The problem comes when you have poles of higher order and then things become a little bit complicated. And I, I'm just going to do an example to show you that things really do get a bit complicated. Let, let us try an order two pole. So here we've got a function a minus two z to minus two plus a minus one z to minus one and so on times dz. And let's again change z to b naught w plus b one w squared and so on. Expand a, the other, a different local coordinate as a power series in z. And let's try and figure out what happens to this power series. Well, it becomes a minus two, and then we've got to take z to the minus two, which is going to be b naught to minus two w to the minus two minus two b one w to the minus one over b naught squared and so on. And then we've got to um, add a to the minus one b naught to minus one w to the minus one plus various terms. And we've got to take this all and we've got to multiply it by dz, which is going to be b naught uh, plus 2b1w and so on, all times dw. And this is beginning to get a bit of a mess. So let's collect together all the terms and see what we get. Well, we get a minus 2b naught to minus 1w to minus 2. And for w to the minus 1, we get this term here and we get this term times this term, and we get this term times this term. And this times this, and this times this cancel out in a, in a 
freakish accident. So we just get a to the minus one, w to the minus one, all times dw. And now what we see is that this is still a to the minus one, but we get a weird cancellation we get quite a lot of unexpected cancellation. And you should also notice that this is not a minus two. So changing local coordinates really does change the coefficient of w to the minus two. And in general, it changes all the coefficients other than the coefficient of w to the minus one. Um, so um, how do we show that this coefficient of w to the minus one dw stays the same? Well, um, if we take any one form, a minus n, z minus n plus, and so on, times dz, and we change z to b naught w plus b1 w squared, and so on, then this term becomes um, some complicated um, coefficient times w to the minus n plus some complicated coefficient times w to the 1 minus n, and so on or times dw. And what are these complicated coefficients? Well, they're polynomials in the um, a minus n, a one minus n, and so on. And they're also polynomials in b naught, b one, and so on. And they're also, you need to take b naught to minus one. So if you expand them all out, you get some mess but it's, it's obvious that this mess is going to be polynomials in these variables here. And furthermore, they're going to be polynomials with integer coefficients. And that's really all we need to know. And we want to show that the polynomial for w to the minus 1 dw is just a minus one. So all the other coefficients, this polynomial is going to be some horrible mess, and we want to show that everything cancels out. And this is, in fact, really easy to do without doing any calculation at all. We notice that it is a minus one over the complex numbers. Um, so it is a minus one over, if we work over the integers. Um, and you notice that it's going to be the same polynomial with integer coefficients, whatever field we work over. Um, well, if you were working over a finite field, it wouldn't really have integer coefficients. But if you, if you do it with integer coefficients and then reduce the integers modulo p, that's what you get if you work over a finite field of order p. Um, so it is a minus one over any field. So this is a really rather weird proof because we're proving something over a field of characteristic P by using contour integration over the complex numbers and then observing that forces it to be true over any field. So the, the, the point is that Z is actually a, a subring of the complex numbers. So if you prove, so, so in order to prove an identity with integer coefficients, it's enough to prove it with complex coefficients. And for that, we can use contour integration. And once you prove it over the integers, we can then just reduce it mod p and get it for any field. So this rather messy identity um, that we need in order to show the residue is well defined, um, the proof over the complex numbers does actually prove it over all fields with this rather a kind of piece of black magic. It looks as if we're cheating, but it is actually valid. Um, finally, um, we want to prove that the sum of all residues of omega at p is equal to zero. And I'm not going to prove this in detail. I'm just going to sketch the main idea of the proof. First of all, it's easy to prove for the projective line P1. For the projective line P1, the residue is just a meromorphic function times dz. You can write a meromorphic function as a sum of partial fractions and just check this by explicit calculation for each partial fraction. So 
we can just say proof by calculation. And now for any curve C, what we do is we map it to P1 by a finite map. And um, if we've got a one form omega on C, what we do is there's a way of pushing the one form forward to a one form on P1 by, well, this is sometimes called taking the trace of a one form. And what you do is you define this trace and then you check that the sum, um, if we call this map F, the sum over F the minus one P of the residue of omega is equal to the residue of the trace of omega at a point P, where P is a point in the projective line. And um, if you can prove this, this obviously proves the sum of the residues of omega is equal to zero because the sum of the residues of omega over all of C is then the sum of the residues of the trace of omega, and this is equal to zero by explicit calculation. So the proof that the sum of the residues of omega is zero reduces to this calculation, checking this here. And again, this is easy to prove over the complex numbers just by using the residue theorem. And you can prove it over all fields by using a kind of trick similar to the way we showed that the residue is well defined, that um, this turns out to be an identity between polynomials with integer coefficients. And since it's true over the complex numbers, it's true over the integers and therefore true over any field. Okay, so that's the, um, completes the discussion of the proof of the Riemann-Roch theorem.